Good afternoon. It's Friday the 28th of April 2023, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Call News. I'm your host, Mike Robinson. Joining me in the studio, Patrick Henningsen. Welcome to the programme, Patrick. Great to be with you, Mike. Uh, and we have Vanessa Bailey joining us uh, from Damascus, as usual, um, by a video link. Uh, we're going to get started here with uh, Andrew Bridgen. Now, uh, this happened after uh, Wednesday's news programme. I'm sure most people have heard about it uh, by now, but uh, we, it, it needs to be discussed. So, uh, he tweeted this out on Wednesday, uh, my expulsion from the Conservative Party under false pretenses only confirms the toxic culture which plagues our political system. Above all else, this is an issue of freedom of speech. No elected member of parliament should ever be penalised for speaking on behalf of those who have no voice. Uh, the party has been sure to make an example of me. Uh, well, of course, making an example of people, Patrick, isn't uh, limited to the Conservative Party at all. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but uh, let's just have a look at a, a minute or so of uh, Andrew Bridgen speaking to GB News on Wednesday. Do you regret saying it now in the cold light of day, given that you've been expelled? It's, um, it's, it's deeply upsetting to be expelled from a party I've served uh, for, uh, for several decades uh, and campaigned hard for, but... I, I, I barely recognise the Conservative Party at the moment. We seem to have moved away from being a party that legislates for the people to a party that legislates against the people. Um, surely I've got the right to free speech to express the genuine and legitimate concerns of my constituents about the safety and efficacy of experimental vaccines which were never tested properly. Uh, we know there's considerable vaccine harms. They're starting to emerge now. And, and Patrick, bef before I spoke out in December, and what urged me to do so was when the, the government were looking at approving the experimental vaccines for children down to the age of six months to babies. Uh, as a result of those speeches I gave in Parliament, um, the government position has moved in a few months from wanting to vaccinate babies of six months, they, that never happened, um, then they moved the position to only over 50s and the immunocompromised uh, in January, for February the 12th. I gave another speech on the 17th of March pointing out how the boosters were, uh, the lack of efficacy and the cost of them and the dangers of them. And then it's moved to over 75s, a completely different position that the government were opting. And I put it to you, there was no one else speaking out. And if that's cost me my political career... Then, then so be it, quite honestly, Patrick, because if I've saved the life or, or one child from being injured, um, that's worth it, isn't it? So that was Andrew Bridgen's position on Wednesday. Uh, his wife, uh, Navina Bridgen, uh, tweeted this out. Uh, so no corrupt and sle sleazy conservative has been expelled uh, despite being embroiled in countless scandals and money grabs, but they've managed to kick out my husband MP, Andrew Bridgen, for simply doing his job and speaking up for the people who elected him. Uh, the date of 12th of April uh, may be the official date they removed him from the Conservative Party, but in reality, the moment he began speaking up about the current issues, our whole family has been targeted and persecuted. Finally, I can talk about the censorship, abuse and racism I've experienced firsthand as political wife in the past six years in Westminster. The truth will finally come to light. Um, so uh, Andrew Bridgen kicked out of the Tory party. Uh, I absolutely accept the points that he's making here, Patrick, uh, the, the the Tory party and the Labour party in their own ways have decided to censor on certain issues. And I mean, that was uh, absolutely expressly demonstrated by the fact that uh, Andrew Mitchell uh, got rid of any Labour party MPs that were still in the House of Commons when Andrew Bridgen was making his last major speech on this issue. Uh, but we've seen, for example, with Corbyn and others, uh, the anti-Semitism trope being used uh, to silence them on Palestinian issues, for example. Well, yeah, but that's an understatement, Mike. I mean, we don't we don't have the tweet that Andrew Bridgen uh, tweeted, but basically, uh, as far as I understand, he was quoting a cardiologist that he was speaking to uh, that called the uh, tremendous vaccine harms uh, something like the medical equivalent of this generation's Holocaust uh, globally. So he he didn't mention uh, Jews or Jewish or anything, uh, and he was quoting somebody else. So it was a pretty innocuous tweet, but because he used the term Holocaust, he was brigaded. And so, look, this is, a, this is an arbitrary, vague term that's clearly being used not to, you know, counter hate or anything like that. It's being used to take out 
political opposition or dissenting figures within the political establishment that are going against the establishment. Mm -hmm. They're exposing corrupt policies. And there's a cheap card to pull. And the same thing they did with Jeremy Corbyn, kicked him out of the Labor Party and Chris Williamson and to, to make it an anti-Semitic issue just because they showed support for the Palestinian cause, for instance. But what was it really about? And we knew from the Times full page spread, it was because Jeremy Corbyn posed such a threat to the national security state industry and the Five Eyes complex. And they went after him and didn't hold back. And the BBC piled in as well. They made it about anti-Semitism, but had nothing to do with anti-Semitism. This term is being weaponized and used for all sorts of purposes, Mike, that have nothing to do with the actual uh, supposed uh, intent um, uh, that the groups that are so-called countering hate, uh, when they latch on to this term and they levy it against people, it really has nothing to do with that. It has to do with using it as a tool to knock out, a Machiavellian tool to knock out yeah. uh, dissent and political opposition. Yeah. Vanessa, have you got any thoughts briefly? No. I mean, you know, it's not surprising, is it? Um, as you've just mentioned, Chris Williamson, Jeremy Corbyn, anybody that goes against establishment these days, doesn't matter which party. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's uh, let's move on to Sudan then. And uh, well, the UK government has been tweeting this out yesterday. 897 people have now been evacuated on eight UK flights. So that only leaves what's that about 1,100 people, assuming that you accept the 1,200 or sorry the 2,000. Uh, uh, UK nationals uh, still in, in Sudan or the 4,000 number. Well, it could be somewhere in between that. Uh, but anyway, 897 have now been evacuated uh, to much fanfare over the last 24 hours or so. Uh, this is what James Cleverly was tweeting out this morning. The ceasefire in Sudan has just been extended. Uh, the UK calls for its full Im implementation by the generals. Uh, British evacuation flights are ongoing. I urge all British nationals wishing to leave to proceed to the airport as quickly as possible to ensure their safety. British uh, nationals? Yes. Why not British citizens? Uh, because it's not just, it's British nationals. But aren't they British citizens? Quite possibly. Yeah. But, but anyway, the point here is they're not getting any support to get to the airport. They've got to do that by themselves. Uh, so the, um, that's, that's a situation that's ongoing. But you'll notice this term. Uh, full implementation by the generals, because of course the generals is a, a, a bit of a, a mainstream media uh, trope at the moment. Uh, it's these two generals uh, fighting each other. So let's just uh, have a look at who we've got here. Uh, we've got uh, Abdel Fattah al Burhan on the Syrian government side, or at least the interim military Sudanese, regime. Yes, yes. So, sorry, Sud Sudanese. I do apologize. Yes, uh, on the military uh, government side and. Uh, Mohammed uh, Hamdad Dagalo, also known as Hameti, uh, who is uh, on the Rapid Support Forces uh, side. and uh, for Formerly known as the Janjaweed. Yes, indeed. So, uh, you know, we've got uh, lots of video coming out of Sudan at the moment showing uh, the, uh, the warfare continuing, lots of uh, people being killed and so on. But uh, those are the two main players. We want to look at uh, Hameti here with Mohammed Hamdan Dagalo. A little bit. Uh, here's uh, well. First of all, let's just talk about the the, the situation because we have a military uh, regime in place in Sudan at the moment, which took power after the coup in 2020. Uh, 2020. No, there were two coups. So there's one in 2019. Yes. And that uh, deceded um, the uh, the old president, who's the arrest warrant um, uh, in the ICC. So yes. he's under house arrest. Um, and so that deceded him. Then a, a power sharing uh, civilian and military government came in. Then there was a second coup that was a, f so you have a full military government that promised to relinquish the reins of power in two years. And that two year period is up. They haven't formed the civilian government. Right. And they promised to uh, take the RSF, which is formerly the Janjaweed militia, yes. uh, accused of war crimes in Darfur, et cetera, um, to uh, amalgamate them into the 
proper military structure of Sudan. And they said that they would like to do that in two years, but the RSF don't want it. They want to do it in 10 years. <clears throat> Why is that? It's because they don't want to be held accountable. Both parties are accused of war crimes. Okay, so the RSF, the former Janjui, they don't want to come officially. They're afraid uh, or they're able to sort of wield power or influence outside of the official defense uh, military structure. So it, th that kind of, they want to have their cake and eat it too, some people will say. Right, okay, but, Burhan, but the point is that Burhan has been uh, calling, uh, saying that they're going to hold elections regularly. Uh, the most recent, as we can see here from Reuters, uh, they're going to, the military are going to exit politics after 2023 elections. And of course, these elections have never happened. And the question is, why have they never happened? Well, there's lots of external interference here, lots of uh, NGOs uh, absolutely making sure that everybody knows that although Sudan's military are calling for elections in 2023, it's a pretty bad idea. We don't want that. The West doesn't want Sudan uh, to have hold elections because they are concerned, they say, uh, about the uh, an incoming Islamist uh, uh, government. Um, now, the Russians have had something to say about this situation in the last couple of days. Um, so here's the permanent mission of the Russian Federation of the United Nations, issued a statement. Uh, and uh, I'm just going to run through a little bit of this. Um, so there's... Uh, uh, the statement, we must state that the current Sudanese crisis is largely caused by an external interference in Sudanese so sovereign affairs, uh, attempts at forced political engineering in the country, and imposing democratic recipes on it. Uh, the political situation in Sudan is not, was not a simple one from the start. Security sector reform in the country was among the most complicated issues that required elevated attention and a thorough negotiation process. At the same time, we saw that many external actors tried to enforce the transfer of authority to, uh, to civil powers artificially and imposed a number of decisions that were not supported amongst the broader population. Reconciliation efforts in the region are underway. Under, underway. The, media, sorry, the mediator efforts of the African Union and the IGAD, as well as neighboring states, the regionals should be given the space and time they need, say the Russians. Uh, it, is pivotal, it is pivotal that the Libyan scenario must not repeat. I remind that with Libya, African efforts were arrogantly kicked aside and the forceful Western intervention that followed caused a true disaster and destabilized half the continent. So my question then is, is there any evidence to support the idea of external interference? Uh, and indeed there seems to be, because here's the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Libyan uh, militia and Egypt's military back opposite sides in the Sudan conflict. Now, which is which? Patrick? Which is which? Uh, so the Egyptians are supporting the Sudanese government and uh, the Libyans supporting the... Uh, uh, the RSF. The RSF. Yeah, yeah. So Haftar um, and other factions are shipping ammunitions uh, have yes. been received shipments. So there's some military assistance there. Um, probably a lot more going on than we couldn't be, you know, than we can glean from mainstream media reporting. Right. So, but here's, here's the, the real coincidence. Uh, because uh, Hameti, the leader of the RSF, uh, met with, what's that, the UK, the US and France uh, just two days, before the, uh, two days before the violence broke out. Mm -hmm. Just a coincidence, I'm sure. Uh, but he met with him two days before the violence broke out. And, but this uh, relationship with Western countries has been going on for a little bit longer. So here is an article from uh, April 2023, but it's talking about events that took place uh, last year. So Hamedi's multi-million dollar image makeover. So there's an effort by the West and France in particular to uh, reinvent this man. To legitimize him and turn yes. him into a political figure. Yes. So last November 2022, a small team of French lobbyists met in Dubai with a simple objective to, to present a vast Hamedi oriented communication strategy for two days at the Grand Millennium Hotel. One presentation after another was seen, slides scrolling by, one detailing the progress of the Hope for Sudan operation, along with a variety of media campaigns, political lobbying, lobbying and online influence, enter a new public relations strategy for the Rapid Support Forces, the RSF. So clearly the Russians are absolutely correct to suggest there is quite a bit of external interference going on here. Um, and uh, well, the question is why? We'll come on to that in a second. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Hameti tweeted this out uh, on the 17th of April, the international community must take action now and intervene. So he's asking his friends in the UK, the United States and France 
to get involved directly in this. What are we talking about here? A no-fly zone? Yeah, well, he says it right there. Uh, he says the, he's accusing the uh, General Burhan, a radical Islamist. It says, this is the radical Islamist accusing the general being a radical Islamist. It's the Spider-Man pointing at Spider-Man, ma'am. And he's saying, who is bombing civilians from the air? His army is waging a brutal campaign against innocent people, bombing them with MiGs. Okay, that's the, that is the Libya no-fly zone script, chapter and verse right there. That Qaddafi was using the Air Force against its own people. That was the trigger for a, NATO, a no-fly zone, a UN resolution. Yes. Uh, so again, why is the West so interested in this? Well, of course, it's because of Russia and China influence in the area and the region as a whole. Uh, but I just want to remind everybody about this article from Arab News that we mentioned uh, last week. Uh, Sudan military finishes review of Russian Red Sea base deal. So this is the Russian uh, Navy wanting to use uh, Sudan port itself uh, as a base for the Russian Navy. But I wanted to highlight a couple of points from this. Uh, the deal was awaiting the formation of a civilian government and a legislative body to be ratified. And Sergei Lavrov uh, reinforced that by saying that the ratification has to take place by this yet to be formed legislative body. So the point here is uh, that this is another reason why the, the West is reluctant to, to move towards uh, a transition to a civilian military, because this would give the go ahead for this deal, uh, which has already effectively been done. The clues are lining up, aren't they, Mike? Yes. <laughs> right. And just uh, just to, before we leave Africa, I just wanted to mention uh, this, um, because Matt Gates uh, in, the, in the United States, obviously, uh, calling for the urgent removal of U.S. troops from Somalia. So just uh, don't want to make any further point than that, other than just to remind everybody that, you know, U.S., U.K., EU, uh, all active in the Sahel region of Africa. Uh, this is a key strategic area. And when we see uh, the likes of uh, what's going on in Sudan kick off, well, maybe we want to be a little, uh, look a little deeper than just accepting the mainstream media narrative of two generals, of two opposing generals having at it. It's not quite as simple as that. And look at the who's tweeted this, Simon Atiba. Everybody, if you're on Twitter, you want to follow Simon Atiba. He's the White House correspondent for uh, Today News Africa. He's one of the best. Um, he's kind of emerged as a really great uh, geopolitical voice as well. So definitely follow him on Twitter. Uh, Vanessa. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because actually, I don't know if you remember, but I mentioned at least two months ago that the front was going to switch to Africa um, of NATO versus Russia and China. And probably the meeting between Russia and China kind of triggered I would say, uh, what's happening in Sudan. And of course, the influx of uh, multinational refugees into Egypt is also potentially the start of the destabil the re destabilization of Egypt. And interesting that it's called Hope for Sudan Operation. What does that remind you of? The Avaaz Smuggle Hope uh, fundraising campaign at the beginning of the regime change war against Syria. They're not very original, are they? No, they keep running the same playbook. <laughs> yeah, and, and the Janjaweed are now the moderate rebels and uh, who are the rightful uh, assumers of power in Sudan, apparently. They'll start wearing white helmets soon. Incredible okay. makeover, incredible image makeover. Yes. Okay, let's uh, move on to Nord Stream then. Well, this is it. This is the big question here. There's President Joe Biden, uh, who, well, he told us uh, they were going to deal with the Nord Stream pipeline a year ago, and they certainly did, apparently. Well, they deny that they did, but all the evidence seems, Mike, to uh, point at uh, U.S. involvement. Um, and so I want to point everybody to, and by the way, you see the Norwegian uh, flag there as well. And we'll talk about that in a second. So look at this article here. This is a report up at 21stCenturyWire.com. It's called The Secret Team, the Nord Stream Pipeline Sabotage Revisited. This is by uh, French journalist Freddy Ponton, Mission Details of the Nord Stream Sabotage. This is an extensive report. There's a lot of military details in here as well. And it's looking at it's looking at Hirsch's report. And I believe if we have him on the line, we have the author of this report, Freddy Ponton, uh, on the live link from France. Hello, Freddy. Hey, hello. Hello, Patrick. Good to be here. Hello. Uh, great to have you with us. So, uh, Freddie, this is a, a very uh, uh, extensive report. There's a lot of detail in here. Um, just walk us through what was your intention uh, for, uh, for writing this and presenting this? Well, the idea of our report, Patrick, was to 
uh, add some meat to the bones of uh, Seymour uh, Hirsch's report that came out in February. Uh, it was a very interesting report outlining some critical fact with regards to this no stream uh, sabotage. So we wanted to not just take uh, everything on, on its face value, but uh, really do the homework and trying to put a name and some kind of a uh, timeline uh, with regards to how this operation would have been conducted. So uh, that is the, uh, the, the the key part of this uh, report for us is to uh, to stay in the real world of uh, deep sea diving and uh, uh, obviously military covered operations uh, or CIA-backed covered operations. And I, and I think that this report is very technical, um, but it also helps uh, people to, to narrow it down and put a face on, on this uh, uh, deep sea divers, Patrick. Yeah, and also, so Fr- Freddie, what you're doing effectively here is you're basically validating uh, the story that Seymour Hirsch published. He's come under a lot of attack and criticism um, from a lot of different uh, people, certainly from the U.S. side, Mainstream media, they're saying, ignore the Hirsch report. Uh, that No, there's another plot. It's a, a rogue Ukrainian cell the Germans are doing an, an investigation now. What's going on with that? Well, obviously, you know, I, I see that as a good news. You know, if uh, if the, 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 the report and Simo Hirsch's report was not so damning for the U.S. administration, I think that they will just have kept silence. So it's good news to see your legacy media coming after Samuel Hirsch, which obviously has, has got the credential and the credibility behind him. But I think uh, also it's important to, to look at his report as a uh, as a kind of invitation for the uh, investigative journalist communities around the world to pick up from there and trying to, to make sense and, and stay within the common sense area as far as to how this was delivered. This is a CIA-backed uh, covered operation operation that is uh, uh, basically planned and operating uh, under the cover of a major navy uh, naval exercise uh, uh, in the Baltic uh, Sea, uh, an exercise known as the Baltop 22. So many people are familiar with, with that name, of course. But uh, what I think what's really important, Patrick, here is to, to be able to, uh, to identify uh, the, the CIA partners, if you will. CIA is known to be working uh, uh, very closely to a certain teams of divers for sh- special operations. So we obviously work very interesting in looking at these kind of connections and uh, identifying also uh, various numbers of uh, what we call EOD groups, which are mainly people responsible for uh, bomb disposal, mine disposal. They, they really are the expert, the top expert in the world as far as uh, handling uh, uh, dangerous explosives. So these are people that would have been brought to the table uh, for the planning uh, and also for perhaps with a rehearsing of, of this opera. Operation. What, what uh, that I'll just like to add, Patrick, is that these these kind of organizations are headquartered at the the naval amphibious base in Little Creek in Norfolk, Virginia. And what's interesting is really just because it is around the corner from the NATO Joint Forces Allied Command transformations. Uh, so now these are the guys that are actually basically uh, uh, behind the uh, the command post, if you will of uh, a large uh, scale exercise such as Baltop 2 alongside with their European counterpart uh, known as Strike for NATO out of Portugal. So this is why this article is very important because it really breaks down the chain of command. It's a bit technical, but it, it provides a, a lot of lot of answer as far as the the, the group of uh, special deep sea divers, but also, and we'll talk about it, sure, uh, about the equipment that these guys are using. And so just to run it through here, uh, this we've got up on screen here, uh, Freddie, Nord Stream sabotage, what Hirsch got right, the evidence. So basically, you're validating uh, the means, the motive, and the opportunity. And so first is Panama City. Hirsch says it's a diving team, a Navy team out of Panama City. Would you say that from your uh, evidence that you're presenting here, that that's accurate. Yes, uh, absolutely accurate. We we trace them, we track them down basically in Panama City. Uh, it's really under NAFC or NSA. 
uh, operations. So NAVC, uh, Navy Command, yeah, is very important because it offers a one-stop shop uh, as far as skills and expertise from uh, uh, various uh, uh, deep sea divers uh, that, that that will be capable of uh, uh, putting out, you know, putting up a job like that. So it was a very very important to 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 verify that, and we can concur that Panama City was at least one of the major sites where the, these teams were recruited from. And then another one is obviously that under the cover of NATO's Baltop 22 uh, in June of 20. So this is last summer, June of 2022. Would you? That's what Hirsch is, uh, has said. Would you say that's accurate? Yes, 100%. I mean, that's the ideal uh, backdrop, if you will, to conduct a, uh, a CIA back covered operation. I mean, this is as good as it gets. You know, you're going to have, uh, uh, you know, 17 countries, uh, hundreds of ships, a lot of training activities that are related to EOD, mine handling, countermeasures, uh, a lot of exercise, a lot of presence. So it's, it's a perfect backdrop. So I, I'm going to have to give him a, a green on that. Uh, and obviously, the investigation is going to uh, is going to is going to move alongside that that, that line as well, so, and, and provides a lot of information, showing a lot of activities in the field of uh, underwater vehicles and uh, uh, bomb disposal, uh, mine countermeasures, exercises, so on. So th- th- this is really absolutely uh, he's right on the money, I would say. And then he's uh, he's saying that uh, there was a P eight um, aircraft that dropped a sonar buoy in September that uh, sent the signal to detonate uh, the C4 explosives on the Nord Stream pipeline. Um, Do you think this is plausible? Well, it's not then more than possible. It's absolutely accurate because the the open source data for for that kind of information is available uh, to the public. So anybody can go and look at it and uh, they'll see the P-8 uh, Poseidon uh, Boeing uh, aircraft coming out of the United States and uh, refueling uh, above the uh, NATO uh, Air Force Command in Germany. Uh, and then uh, after separating from the refueling plane, they go and head straight for the uh, uh, off the shore of the uh, Bornholm island of the Danish coast. So we know they are losing a lot of altitude. The data shows clearly they're losing a lot of altitude suddenly. So they're dropping something and then they head straight back to the United States without stopping by the UK, which is a normal stop for them uh, to come into Europe, especially to the Baltics area. So again, uh, a lot of uh, good questions have been uh, basically asked with regards to the motivation of choosing uh, refueling positions uh, in Germany instead of doing this simply in the United Kingdom. So, but uh, yeah, he's absolutely right. The data shows that. And just quickly, we've got Norway involved in the sabotage mission. Uh, have you, are you, you've shown evidence for this, correct? Well, I mean, really, the, the, the first part, because it's a two-part article, uh, as you know, Patrick. So what we, we, we are looking here is at really laying the bricks, the foundation uh, to um, to support, uh, uh, basically, the, the to provide the evidence that supports what her, uh, Samuel Hirsch is, is, is saying. So uh, if he's incorrect, we will say it. But uh, uh, until now, we, we can say with great confidence that a U.S., Norway, even perhaps the U.K., and maybe another NATO member states will, would be involved in that operation. So it's uh, part two will provide a, a lot of m- more information about the involvements of other NATO members. That, that's all I can say at this stage. And then lastly, um, to do with the motive, um, you're positing here that the U.S. and Norway have cornered the market, the gas market for Northern Europe as a result of the Nord Stream pipeline explosion. Well, that's really, of course, the, uh, you know, when, when you look at a, at a crime scene and, uh, and a crime investigations, you're going to want to answer the, uh, the obvious question, which is uh, the, uh, the criminal questions as far as to who's going to benefit from that. And uh, I think it's really, uh, it, it's, not a, it's not a brainstorm exercise to, uh, to, to look at Norway's interest and the German uh, also interest, as well as the USA interest in this uh, gas market and uh, what I call the hydrogen market uh, that has been shaping up uh, uh, over the last past two years to, to place Norway and Germany as, a, a, as the major players in the hydrogen market as well. And all that will, will be discussed in part two of our, uh, of our articles. But clearly, 
clearly Norway and Germany are, are the forefront of those that, that benefit the, to the most. Of course, Poland uh, with this uh, uh, gas project uh, with Norway. So a lot of interest coming out of Poland, Norway and uh, uh, Germany and the United States, of course. Okay. And then what about the UK? You brought up something that doesn't, no one likes to talk about uh, here in the UK. And that's uh, this woman here doing her best impression of Hillary Clinton uh, on the cell phone, uh, Liz Truss, who was prime minister for a very brief time in England or in the UK. Uh, and she, the phone hacking claims that somehow um, her, her SMS messages showed a text message uh, to Tony Blinken right after the Nord Stream detonation. And here you've got the quote, or this in here in the article. So you're saying perfidious Albion. Are they perfidious? And former UK Prime Minister Trust says it's done to Blinken right after the blasts. <laughs> um, so that that sort of puts the UK in the frame, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. I mean, it's really uh, uh, obviously very damning uh, for the prime. I mean, she was a very, very uh, for a very short time in, in office. So, uh, but for her to be uh, uh, to be involved in in that kind of a uh, act and, uh, and the, the the message is so damning. I mean, really, really, really bad uh, for a prime minister to get involved in in this kind of thing. But clearly, it points the finger at, at the UK. But uh, this is really the the least. Uh, of evidence that, that that can be brought forward uh, to to explain how the the, the UK has something to do. Uh, we don't know how deep uh, th this goes, but uh, clearly there is a very very strong link uh, that uh, which evidence can be backed uh, that's linked basically this US operation and uh, and and the UK. Uh, and that is going to be uh, mostly the article part one talks about a, a company it's called uh, M Subs uh, operating in your backyard guys in, in Plymouth uh, manufacturing basically the latest uh, um, what they call DCS which are uh, dry combat submersible and uh, this company uh, operates uh, with uh, um, also uh, US uh, SOCOM the special operation commands of the Navy and these guys are the ones that provide all the equipment for the Navy SEALs especially for the special teams Teams and uh, the the DCS is uh, is manufactured in the UK and this is really the, the best at the moment on the market. Uh, we saw the U United States government in investing a lot of money in this, in, into this technology, trying up, did a lot of testing and eventually certifying this uh, uh, this uh, dry combat submersible coming out of the UK. So very interesting there because uh, of course uh, it was important in this investigation to to be realistic about how such operation at deep sea level we're talking about 60 70 meters off the shore of bomb Holmes island but if you look at north stream one we're talking about 80 90 up to 100 meters depth now when you operate in this kind of conditions everything changing the rules are changing and it means that you you need to have a, a well-crafted plan as far as uh, taking the time, having your divers at the bottom of the sea, placing some charges, and more importantly, you need to have a serious extra, uh, exit strategy as well because uh, you don't bring back these people. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's not just a... Uh, a kind of a free dive exercise, you know, you're going to have to face the reality of uh, compression and recompression and obviously perhaps the, the utilizations of uh, hyperbaric uh, chambers as well. So there's a lot of uh, only few organizations and, uh, and, and partners that can provide that technology. We've identified them already. And again, it, 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 it brings into the equations three countries, inc including UK, Norway, and France. Uh, so we'll reveal that in, in part two. But uh, clearly, as I said, you know, if you if you spend more than ten hours or even nine ten hours uh, at one hundred meters, you're going to be subjected to these kind of requirements, you know, and, and challenges of recompression and compressions. Uh, you can, I mean, some divers are known to stay a month, you know, in, in the recompression chambers after the, these kind of dives. And, so, uh, so, you're I, saying, I, so you're saying that uh, the, the New York Times' uh, latest cover story of the uh, rogue Ukrainian cell rented a pleasure craft, a couple of scuba divers leapt off, <laughs> went, did the job, came back and had cocktails by dinner time. You don't think this is plausible? 
Yeah, they were probably entertaining a, a party at 100 meters, you know, in uh, in uh, deep sea. You know, I mean, I mean, let's 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 be honest here; it's ridiculous. And any things that I've seen so far that are, that are comes as, as a claim uh, are some kind of a potential scenario that that could explain what happened. Is is been ludicrous whether it comes from Denmark, Sweden, or Germany, you know, with their ledger boats, you know, and the trace of uh, of TNT, you know. I mean, we we into Wonderland. This is for Hollywood, you know, but the reality is different. You, we people need to start listening to uh, the um, oil and gas professional, those that actually have experience diving on on pipelines. Uh, we have to face the reality that these explosions were massive. We're talking about several hundreds of of TNT C four used a uh, long dive probably also looking at uh, uh, understanding that today uh, the pipeline as we know it uh, is certainly as uh, uh, as kind of a uh, moved uh, from its original positions you know so uh, the, the so, Swedish so Freddie, uh, Freddie just to uh, just to wrap this up real quick sure. and just to note the the range on the mini sub that you mentioned it matches the depth uh, 260 feet of the pipeline, so it's operational, absolutely matches up. And the other thing you brought up, which is key, that you'll be expanding on, is they would have had to work with the experts of the oil and gas uh, services industry because they're the ones that install pipelines. They also blow up pipelines um, as well, and they remove pipelines. So they would also have the tech and the expertise as well. I just wanted to point that out. Um, and also, yeah, we're going to wrap this segment up, but, uh, Freddie, uh, again, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, and, uh, any fi- just a final, a final thought, Freddie, on this? Yeah, I think it's, it's important. I mean, especially for us, you know, members of the European unions to really investigate this, uh, this sabotage. It, it, it is a, it is really a, a, an act of terrorism. Clearly, there's no other way to call it. And as far as I'm concerned, as a European citizen, I, I want to know if someone is a foreign power is able to, to come onto the, the European shores and, uh, and, uh, basically blast anything, uh, uh, that, that's bothered them, whatever it is for, you know, for, for, for market exposures. Or or financial interest, but uh, this is really, really a big problem as far as our critical infrastructures, and we need to address it. Thank you, and thank you very much. Freddie Ponton, the article's up at 21stCenturyWire.com, The Secret Team, uh, Nord Stream Sabotage Revisited. And if you want a more in-depth uh, conversation, you just go here. We've got a long-form interview that I did with Freddie a couple of days ago. Uh, the Nord Stream bombing, Hirsch was right. Here's the proof. That's about 45 minutes long. And I might add, just to back up what Freddie said, Mike, the, the, in the UN Security Council, both the US and the UK vetoed calls by the Russian Federation for an investigation. Is Why would they do that, Mike? I can't imagine. Only if they're involved, it seems to me. I mean, that's just my opinion, but, you know, it seems, it seems that can be the only explanation. Okay, look, thank you very much, Patrick. Thank you, Freddie. Uh, let's move on to Vanessa now. And Vanessa, uh, 75 years uh, since Israel's independence. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is an extraordinary uh, speech that was published or was, was basically disseminated pretty much all over Twitter um, this morning. EU and Israel, von der Leyen, our Ursula looking very Thatcher-esque actually in this video. Um, today we celebrate 75 years of uh, Israel's independence built, of course, on the Nakba in 1948, the genocide of the Palestinians and friendship uh, with Europe. Let's have a look at the video because it oozes support for Israel. And you'll see why I use that word. Dear President Herzog, dear friends, 75 years ago, a dream was realized with Israel's Independence Day. After the greatest tragedy in human history, the Jewish people could finally build a home in the Promised Land. Today, we celebrate 75 years of vibrant democracy in the heart of the Middle East. 75 years of dynamism, ingenuity, and groundbreaking innovations. You have literally made the desert bloom, as I could see during my visit to the Negev last year. Today, we also celebrate 75 years of friendship between Israel and Europe. We have more in common than geography would suggest. 
our shared culture, our values, and hundreds of thousands of dual European Israeli citizens have created a deep connection between us. Europe and Israel are bound to be friends and allies. Your freedom is our freedom. Happy birthday to all the people of Israel. Yom Huledet Sameach. Just to confirm everybody, no. that was an AI uh, version of Ursula von der Leyen. <laughs> she couldn't actually make it. So they have that service available in Brussels for everybody now. Yes, it is incredible. Yeah. That, that was an incredible speech. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it just sort of, I, I mean, even the phrase made the desert bloom. I mean, this is a complete racist phraseology that, that eradicates Palestinian history. And actually, there's been a huge backlash, not only from uh, Palestine movements from within Palestine itself, um, but even from academics in Europe and the UK. Um, this article by Press TV, catering to the cult of Zionism, EU chiefs desert bloom remarks to storm. It's worth reading simply because it, it contains all of the comments that have been made so far, as I said, by academics. Um, West and East. But if we look at some of the comments on uh, Twitter, for example, this is Chris Doyle from the Council for Arab British Understanding. Disgraceful colonial mindset parroting Zionist propaganda about making the desert bloom, as I mentioned. Palestinians were making it bloom well before Israel existed, and the Nabataeans were doing it thousands of years ago to call Israel a vibrant democracy as it maintains a system of apartheid. Uh, and then moving on just to see a few others. So this is prominent Palestinian politician, legislator and activist Hanan Ashwari also took to Twitter hit, to hit out at von der Leyen calling her statements absolutely disgraceful. The president of the European Commission is expected to have more knowledge, integrity and responsibility than spouting this vacuous regurgitation of tired old Zionist cliches and anti-Palestinian racist tropes that erase our very existence, demeaning love fest. I think that's actually probably the best description of the speech. Um, Palestine hits back. This is an article from The Cradle. Uh, hits back at EU official for racist remarks. The PA, the Palestinian Authority, has called on European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen to apologize for remarks made during a speech commemorating Israel's uh, 75th anniversary. And then let's look at what they said in their statement. The state of Palestine affirms that such propagandist discourse dehumanizes and erases the Palestinian people and falsifies their rich history and civilization. Likewise, such a narrative perpetuates the continued and racist denial of the Nakba and whitewashes Israel's illegal occupation and apartheid regime. It is also a betrayal to European citizens who do not endorse such racist erasure of the Palestinian people. President Ursula von der Leyen owes them and the Palestinian people an apology. Now, where can you make the bridge between von der Leyen in Ukraine and von der Leyen in Israel? Of course, through Netanyahu, we've mentioned before, Netanyahu um, re re-elected um, is a revisionist Zionist that follows the Yabotit the ideology Yabotinsky uh, actually collaborated with Simon Petlura, one of the first or the first president of the U Republic of Ukraine. Um, and so this expansionist kind of secular elitism, which does collaborate and cooperate with Nazism, um, demonstrates is demonstrated, let's say, by the language that von der Leyen is using in Israel. Yes, okay. Definitely elitist. Uh Ursula von der Leyen. <laughs> yeah, yes. She's the epitome of <laughs> elitist technocrat. Uh, absolutely. Okay, uh, let's move on then. If you like what the UK Column does, you'd like to support us, please head over to community.ukcolumn.org. Uh, options to help us out there. Your membership, very much welcome and appreciated. Uh, you could pick something up at the UK Column shop, uh, but please do share anything you find on the various platforms, especially from ukcolumn.org uh, or from uh, UK Column Extracts, uk. Uh, Quick reminder that tomorrow, uh, Louise Collins and Liberty Tactics will be hosting 
uh, a podcast-a-thon uh, in support of uh, uh, the Public Child Protection Wales group uh, and uh, Matt Lestissier taking part in that, a whole host of other people, uh, begins 12 p.m. Saturday, 29th of April until 6 p.m. Sunday, the 30th of April. So this is to raise uh, money for the uh, for, uh, Public Child Protection Wales. Um, and uh, so they have uh, a fundraiser campaign going on at the fundraiser.com website. Uh, they've raised £7,774 so far, which is fantastic. That's 30, 31% of their goal. Um, of course, they're aiming to raise money to continue their legal challenges and so on. So uh, that is uh, well worth the effort. I like that logo of Liberty Tactics of smashing the all-seeing eye yes. pyramid. Very cool. Yes. Um, okay, uh, let's come on to Ukraine then. And uh, well, Zelensky and uh, President Xi uh, decided to have a uh, telephone call on uh, Wednesday. Uh, it, I believe that uh, it was Zelensky that asked for this call. Um, so uh, he was waiting for a month, waiting by the phone. Yes. Like pining for a Tinder date. He yeah. was waiting for Xi to call. Uh, well, Xi didn't call. He had to call Xi oh, in, the, in the end. But anyway, the, the Chinese did uh, push out this uh, statement. The two sides exchanged views on China-Ukraine relations and on the UK Ukraine crisis. China will send the special representative of the Chinese government on Eurasian affairs to Ukraine and other countries to have in-depth communication with all parties on the political settlement of the Ukraine crisis. You'll note that they're saying on the political settlement of the Ukraine crisis, uh, China has sent multiple batches of humanitarian assistance to Ukraine and will keep providing help to the best of its ability. Uh, dialogue and negotiation are the only viable ways forward. There is no winner in nuclear wars on the nuclear issue. All relevant parties must stay calm and exercise restraint. And the reason that they, were, they mentioned this in their uh, uh, statement was because Zelensky had, uh, issue, had uh, raised the issue of the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant uh, and so anyway, the uh, statement goes on to say, uh, all part relevant parties must stay calm and exercise restraint, truly act in the interests of their own future and that of humanity, and jointly manage the crisis. With rational thinking and voices now on the rise, it's important to seize the opportunity to build up if favorable conditions for the polit political settlement of the crisis. So um, that's the Chinese position. That statement in the middle, with rational and thinking and th rational thinking and voices now on the rise. Yes. I've not heard anybody else besides us um, uh, trying to say such a thing. But uh, indeed. Interesting, the Chinese choice of words. Uh, and in the meantime, if we come back uh, to the United States then, well, Matt Gates has been busy. So uh, there's a, he has put a, a resolution in, House Resolution 300. Uh, so this has been introduced by Representative Matt Gates into Congress. It calls for the President and Secretary of Defense to transmit to Congress all documents indicating any plans for current or future military assistance to Ukraine. He's, it's calling for an audit on the, uh, the, the, the money that's already gone. Uh, and the bill is also including a provision uh, requiring the Pentagon to describe to Congress documents related to U.S. special forces deployed on the ground in Ukraine. But it was the audit, Vanessa, that I was particularly interested in here because, uh, of course, it's very common that uh, money is being pumped into war zones around the world, uh, and that money goes with, with no audit trail whatsoever. And uh, Syria is a perfect example of this. So just wanted to get your thoughts. This is a, a really important point that Matt Gates has raised as, as part of this resolution, uh, and uh, it's something that should be encouraged. Mm, absolutely. I mean, with all of these uh, sponsorship of wars and regime changes and so on on destabilization projects, there is absolutely no transparency on where the funding goes. You'll get these kind of anodyne statements from the UN or UN agencies, but they do not show you exactly to whom these funds are given and by whom are they handled. There is no transparency. Yes. Okay. Now, uh, Vanessa, let's move on to Turkey and Syria. Uh, talks resume. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this was the 25th of April. There was the um, meeting between the defense ministers of Syria, Turkey, Russia, and Iran in Moscow. Um, if we move on, how Turkey is selling this meeting. So Syrian Turkish presidents could meet in May, according to the Turkish foreign minister. Um, this is a little bit far-fetched, and it's a lot of um, PR being done by Erdogan's administration. So Al-Watan media in Syria, which is pretty reliable and actually sort of picking up on what was said, 
A Syrian source denies the statements of the Turkish Ministry of Defense, which talks about concrete steps related to normalizing relations between Turkey and Syria. This is important because this has definitely not been agreed, according to officials here in Syria. The meeting between the defense ministers of Syria, Turkey, Russia and Iran only discussed the mechanism for the withdrawal of Turkish forces from Syrian territory. The meeting did not address any normalization steps between the two countries. The source added that normalization or natural relations between Turkey and Syria means the withdrawal of the Turkish forces, and there are no normal relations without the withdrawal. Of course, this has always been the red line of President Assad. And the source continued the withdrawal is the first issue that must be resolved in the talks on the normalization process. Um, so that's a pretty strong message. Um, then suddenly we had um, rumors that President Erdogan was suffering um, uh, with a kind of myocarditis. Um, this was rapidly squashed by um, sort of his party aligned media and the spokesperson um, for the Republic, which if you move on, that's on Twitter. We categorically reject such baseless claims regarding President Erdogan's health. The president will attend tomorrow's nuclear power plant opening via video conference. So that kind of slightly confirms that he does have health issues and he's had health issues for some time. No amount of disinformation can dispute the fact that the Turkish people stand with their leader, et cetera, et cetera. So there we had a little bit of a hiccup from Erdogan. And of course, the elections are looming. But let's see to what extent Turkey is actually uh, committing to this normalization process, which, as Syria has stated, can't happen without the withdrawal of Turkish troops. And by Turkish troops, we're also talking about the, the so-called Syrian National Army, which consists of uh, extremist groups such as Jaish al-Islam, who were previously occupying uh, areas of Syria, including uh, east of Damascus, um, in eastern Ghouta, and uh, former ISIS commanders. So here we have a fairly recent report. It's based on evidence that uh, Human Rights Watch has put forward. And of course, Human Rights Watch are not always or, or rarely the most reliable on any information regarding Syria and have a pretty secure revolving door with the CIA. But however, the, the evidence of this um, has been there since the beginning of the conflict in 2011. And there is now a monitoring organization picking, keeping track of the hostilities in Syria, um, which listed 277 distinct occurrences between October 2015 and April 2023. At least 234 fatalities and 20, 231 injuries were noted by the monitors most of which happened while victims, which are Syrian refugees, tried to cross the border back into Syria. Um, at least 26 incidents involved children with at least 20 killed and 15 injured, according to the report. So this is basically Turkish soldiers firing on, abusing and torturing, detaining, um, arbitrary violence against uh, Syrians trying to cross back into Syria. And as I said, this has been going on for the last 12 years. And then let's have a look. So on the day of the meeting, the Turkish army begins plans for a 30 kilometer security belt in Syria's north. And they have been digging the trench for building um, the separation wall, which if you want to imagine it, I have seen it in the areas that they've built it already on, on Syrian territory. It's very like the apartheid wall in Israel. Um, so they've basically uh, been digging the trench for this wall in the Ras al Ain uh, countryside, which Ras al Ain itself is still under siege by the Syrian National Army, which is the proxy of uh, Turkey and Erdogan occupying and annexing now uh, Syrian territory. And although citizens in Ras al Ain have been um, protesting the trenches and have stood in the way of the bulldozers, etc., Again, very reminiscent of, of the uh, Israel-Palestine situation. Um, so for temporarily, the digging has been halted. Um, but the language from Erdogan's administration is that they're not going to withdraw militarily. They will maintain a military presence. And here, uh, it's quite clear that they still have ambitions to annex Syrian territory. Yes. Uh, sorry, Vanessa, just to say that that last couple of articles came from the cradle, is that correct? 
Thing, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, look, I just wanted to get your thoughts on this because this was the Financial Times um, mm -hmm. uh, from yes uh, from Wednesday. Uh, how far should the Arab world go in normalizing Assad? And if we just zoom in the subhead there, uh, Sudan holds a lesson for those heads of state now beating a path to Damascus. Uh, and they're saying, so far, Assad has not been invited to the Arab League su summit in Riyadh next month. But even if he is, welcome back into the fold. It's well worth remembering that such visits did not save Sudan's Omar Bashir, nor did it help his country. And uh, they're almost suggesting that... Uh, uh, Sudan only started to make progress. That progress seems to be going to hell at the moment in the handcart. But in the meantime, uh, it, Sudan only st began to make progress. They said once Bashir had, was out of the way and was effectively mm -hmm. indicted by the ICC, and that's really what needs to be happening with uh, with uh, uh, Bashar al-Assad in order for, Sudan, for, for Syria to move forward as well. It seems to be the position of the FT here. I just wanted to get your comments mm -hmm. on that. Well, it reads to me as a veiled warning to those Arab states that are normalizing relations uh, with Syria, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. Well, th exa mm -hmm. that's exactly how it came across to me as a bit of a, a bit mm -hmm. of a threat. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, let's move on to this then. Um, I just wanted to, to mention in passing uh, the uh, amount of money being spent on arms and armaments at the moment. So this is uh, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. And their headline is here, world military expenditure reaches new record high as European spending surges. So they're talking about uh, the European Union countries uh, spending much more def uh, on defense uh, using language like, uh, you know, Cold War levels of spending and so on. But it was the United States that I thought we would just mention, particularly in context of potential conflict with China. Uh, so the United States remains by far the world's biggest military spender, U.S. military spending reached $877 billion in 2022, which is 39% of total global military spending and three times more than the amount spent by China. That's that's impressive. But according, it's impressive that none of it works either, like F-35, for example. But according to you, most U.S. politicians, we need to spend more. We need to modernize our military, and you know we don't want to be weak uh, in the face of Xi Jinping. Yes. Right. But no, where's the European expenditures coming from? Backfilling with new gear, all the stuff that they sent to, to Ukraine for metal recycling. Yes. So, uh, i.e., um, on the field <laughs> yes. in, in Ukraine. So, yeah, it's great for business, this great, war. Great for business, absolutely. Okay, let's move on to censorship and online safety and so on. Uh, and what do we have here, Patrick? US, UK, and EU governments all heading in the same direction. Yeah, so let's just do a review here. There's some, There's things going on in the UK in the EU and in the US on this issue. Yeah, so of course the online safety bill is in the House of Lords at the minute. So uh, this was published yesterday. Lords continues line by line scrutiny of online safety bill. And I just wanted, aside from that, just to remind everybody what the implications of this bill are uh, if it becomes an act. So first of all, censorship, absolutely a key part of this bill. Uh, second of all, Ofcom becomes the chief censor, becomes the chief censor and the chief spy. Uh, because uh, the ban on end-to-end -end encryption is, equals mass surveillance, bulk data collection, and Ofcom will be the bulk data collector. And if you remember, many people discussing that Ofcom effectively becomes or get, gets more access to our own as, as uh, citizens, uh, members' uh, data than even the intelligence services have had access to up until now. Uh, and of course, the other major aspect of this is age verification. Uh, and uh, of course, this is supposedly to prevent children from accessing inappropriate websites like uh, porn websites and so on. But this is ushering in digital ID. That is the ultimate destination of this. But look, just before you say, I just want to put this on because this, I think it's really important. Forget about the Manhattan, Matt Hancock bit. Uh, Anti-vax misinformation is deeply harmful to public health. Matt Hancock says, I'm backing Jim Bethel's amendment, which continued the work we began when we added anti-vax to the online harms bill. No longer can we simply allow this dangerous rubbish to be spotted online. Who, who qualifies or what qualifies him to decide what is dangerous rubbish and what isn't? But the point here is we need to keep, I'm just going to suggest people keep an eye on Lord Bethel because he is uh, pushing very hard many of the amendments uh, that are going into the online safety bill at the moment. Anyway, Patrick. No, I, I could say a lot about Matt Hancock's uh, rich comment there, yes. but 
Um, the thing in the UK, Mike, with Ofcom, it's also going to give them purview over search engines, major search engines. So how far will this go? Are they going to be involved in how subjects and keywords get ranked or visibility on search uh, engines? Uh, I mean, absolutely once, visibility, yes. Once you allow a, a sensor that deeply into the workings of the internet, the main tools of the internet, like search engines, where does it end? Where, where's the restraint limit? For government, so the, you can't. My opinion, you can't even let them into this area because once you do, then you, you it's very going to be very hard to 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 constrain government, Mike. Well, that's why, Patrick. For the last three years, we've been encouraging our viewers and listeners to get involved in campaigning against this piece of legislation because it, once it becomes law, uh, we are in a very difficult position. Not just UK Column and other alternative media, but everybody that uses social media or uses online search, whether, whether, whatever the search engine of, of choice that you have and so on. So it's vital that this is stopped. Is there anything our viewers can do in, in, this, in the UK uh, in this process as it stands now to get involved or to make their voice known? Well, there, there are lots of people campaigning against this. And uh, so it's not, uh, you know, the, the, it's not too hard to find uh, the campaign groups and help them join yeah. them. And it's an issue you might want to raise with your member of parliament, right? 100%. Okay. Yes. Well, so where does that take us? All hands on deck. That's where it takes us. Yeah. So here's Michael Schellenberger. Um, he's ri risen to prominence in the U.S. Uh, doing the tw Twitter files uh, journalism alongside of Matt Taibbi uh, and others. He's also a great uh, filmmaker and a great uh, author and a campaigner. But here's what he's re revealed here, Mike, on the European front. He's speaking to an anonymous source, trust and safety professional, this person is, from within the social media industry has come forward to warn of European Union censorship, which is coming to America. So he's explaining both the EU and the US uh, threats here to free speech. So this anonymous professional says it's even worse than you think. Prior to Elon Musk taking over the company, Twitter was part of the apparatus. And in, in any case, even now, it is too big to kill. Smaller dissidents are liable to get squished uh, before they become a ser they seriously threaten the established order uh, before anyone even knows they exist. That's a bit frightening there. And he goes on, Michael Schellenberger says, incredible, basically, the censors had control over all major platforms then. And just to explain here, the, this is on his uh, Twitter feed, which he has a subscription. I couldn't read the whole thing, but I'm just giving you the, the preamble. The European Union is now officially requiring expanded censorship of social media platforms, including Twitter, Google, and Facebook. On Tuesday, Europe's top internet regulator, uh, Thierry uh, Breton, uh, said that 19 online platforms and search engines have become systematically relevant and have special responsibilities to make the internet safer. So they've earmarked those organizations. So the EU uses the same censorship pretext as the U.S. censorship industrial complex outlined in the Twitter files investigations to, quote, prevent harm. And Sa this, of course, originated in the U.K. in 2017. This is where this idea of online harms came from from number 10, uh, when they invited the big tech companies in for a discussion with uh, Amber Rudd and Theresa May. What's the term they use um, between to differentiate legal speech? They say legal, but... Legal, well, the legal but harmful thing has been walked back from. So, that, so this... It, but you, they tried it. Yes, and you introduced a really key point here, Patrick, because uh, although the legal but harmful thing has been walked back with respect to the, the legislation, what the legislation in the UK does, and the same in the EU, and undoubtedly will be in the United States as well, is that they are going to require, on pain of uh, jail time and massive fines, that uh, if a social media company has a particular set of terms and conditions, that those are absolutely uh, followed to the letter. And if you're not following your terms and conditions, if you're allowing posts to stay up that it says in your terms and conditions, would be in breach of so-called community guidelines. And if you allow that to stay up, then you would be subject to fines uh, and, and potentially uh, prison time as well. <laughs> Maybe not. best not to publish any community guidelines, right? Well, this is the, this is the problem. But basically, the governments tried to push the draconian uh, fascistic approach. Didn't fly. People pushed back too hard against it. And so they're pushing the responsibility back onto the tech companies. And then they'll try to... Well, we'll show you what they're going to do. So... Um, and we'll go here. Okay, yes, the EU has, is using the same censorship pretext as the U.S. censorship industrial complex to prevent harm. The companies will have to do more 
they say, to tackle disinformation, give more protection and choice to users, and ensure stronger protection for children or risk fines of as much as 6% of their global turnover, says Reuters. So they're going to threaten them to find them out of business. And remember, that's not profit, that's turnover. So that could wipe out a company's profits entirely. So that's pretty scary. Uh, <laughs> think about it for a minute. So here, the latest drop of the Twitter files by Paul, uh, journalist Paul Thacker. Now, so just to tell you, this is the games that are going on behind the curtain, that if you allow this to move forward, this is what the establishment will do when they're colluding behind the scenes against journalists and users. Look at this. So why did, Tucker, why did Twitter censor Tucker Carlson? Better yet, who helped Twitter do that? This is a, an unbelievably revealing thread here by Paul Thacker. Let me just give you the, the basics of it here. So, so Twitter then published Tucker Carlson... Um, Punished. Or punished, sorry, Tucker Carlson for, his, for this op-ed that he published. I guess this is on Fox News' website. So Tucker actually cited the World Health Organization's own website, uh, which stated that the WHO was not recommending children to get the COVID vac. So here's the headline that Tucker published. This was June of 2021. The COVID vaccine is dangerous for kids. Big tech doesn't want you to know that. Even posting WHO guidance could get you censored. So that's the claim. So Tucker was running with that angle that even the WHO said it's not safe for kids. So this is what happened next. So behind the scenes, the collusion begins. Then he, say, he looked at the WHO's website and basically they, Mike here, they've done stealth editing. They've done some stealth editing. He found a stealth edit uh, where they removed this passage from their page stating they that which that stated they did not recommend kids to get vaccinated. And so then they then colluded with the so-called fact checkers um, to, but I don't have another slide for that, right. but they colluded with the uh, so-called fact checkers and then attacked Tucker Carlson and said that he, he got it wrong, that he lied. And so then they went to try to, you know, put pressure on Twitter to deal with his account, et cetera. So you see behind the scenes what's going on. Yes. So they're wiping things from the internet, doing ministry of truth, real, real time edits, Wikipedia style, and then using those changes to then attack people for making claims online as being, quote, disinformation. Yeah. So Tucker Carlson been fired from Fox. I don't know if you had covered that. We have not covered it, but... Okay. So no, the number one rated cable news program in America by a long shot uh, Fox fired Tucker on Monday. This is the biggest story in the United States, definitely on the uh, the media front. So he's on $10 million a year, something like that. Their number one flagship program, but they couldn't stand him at Fox because he was breaking all the rules. So they finally found an excuse or a set of excuses to get rid of him. Everyone's doing victory laps about deplatforming uh, Tucker, including Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and other sort of brigading people that went for all the sponsors at Fox, Audi, the car manufacturers, everybody, to get them to drop their accounts mm -hmm. because of Tucker Carlson. They're claiming that he was killing people because of his COVID misinformation. Which is the same narrative that Matt Hancock was tweeting out, this, this is dangerous, it's killing people, we've got to stop it. Yeah, the vaccine misinformation yeah. And, and also cons dangerous conspiracy theories. Okay, so so who knows what's going to happen, but uh, uh, something like a, a few billion dollars dropped off the value of News Corporation with the announcement of, uh, of firing Tucker. I don't know. I haven't looked at the st share prices yet, but did it rebound? So Tucker's gone straight. We don't know where he's going to go after this. He's been courted with a lot of opportunities, but he's gone straight to Twitter yesterday here. And look at this. He's put up this message. Look at the numbers. Take a closer look here. This was yesterday. Uh, it was 8 million views, or 20, tw yeah, 24. Yeah, so it was 24.3 million views of the tweet and 8 million views of the actual video clip. The, yeah, so, yes. so already, you know, just posting that on Twitter, he's getting incredible uh, traction. Yes. So that's, that's where things are headed for U.S. media. Will he go to Rumble? Uh, a lot of people think that he might go to Rumble, and, or he's being chased by even CNN's board, uh, I heard, is considering making an offer to Carlson, believe it or not. Everybody's after him, well, so, so we'll see. I, I don't see, yes, okay. Mm -hmm. we'll, 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 watch, we'll watch and see. Right, okay, let's uh, just mention this. Uh, well, the BBC, we're breaking this uh, this morning. Uh, BBC Chairman Richard Sharp resigns. 
uh, after a report finds he breached appointment rules by not fully disclosing role in loan given to former Prime Minister Boris Johnson. So uh, here is his statement. Uh, we'll just have a look at a couple of co his comments here. I'd like to thank a a Adam Heppenstall and his team for the diligence and professionalism they've shown in compiling uh, today's report. Uh, Mr. Heppenstall's view is that while I did breach the government's code for uh, public appointments, he states very clearly that a breach does not necessarily invalidate an, appoint an appointment. Okay. Uh, I feel that this matter may well be a distraction from the corporation, that's BBC's good work, uh, were I to remain in post until the end of my term. I've therefore this morning resigned as BBC Chair and Secretary of State to the, and to the Board. Uh, and uh, after extensive work, uh, Heppenstall states his words, uh, that he is happy to record that he has seen no evidence to say I played a part whatsoever in the facilitation arrangement or financing of a loan for the former Prime Minister. Um, so he's still, he's doubling down on this position that uh, uh, really there was nothing to see here. He didn't help Boris Johnson get his 800, whatever it was, 800,000 pound loan or whatever uh, amount it was, can't remember. Do they do that to each other? These guys loan each other 800 grand? Well, you see, he's supposed, to, he's supposed to have put somebody in touch with uh, Simon Case of the Cabinet Office, uh, and that eventually ended up with uh, Boris getting a bung of some kind. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, the other thing about this was that he, he had asked Boris uh, before the recruitment process began for the new chairman for the BBC, chairmanship for the BBC, before that recruitment process began, Richard Sharp asked, said to Boris, I want the job. Uh, and then he, and then this loan was somehow facilitated, and then he got the job, and that's what this is all about. So he's denying that he actually played any direct role in the loan, other than uh, putting uh, Simon Case together with the person who loaned the money in the first place. Oh, BBC is not state-run media, is it, Mike? It's, no, it's oh, not. It's not. You know, who who dare even say that? Okay, Vanessa, let's uh, <clears throat> move on to. Uh, uh, 15 minute cities, and uh, well, a German member of the European Parliament has been commenting on this. Yes, um, sorry, uh, her name's just escaped me. Can you put Chris, Christine Anderson? <laughs> uh, that's it, <laughs> Christine Anderson. Um, this again was a was a video that was circulating on social media this morning, and I have to say, it's probably one of the best summaries of what 15 minute cities actually mean. Now, of course, the caveat is if you look up Christine Anderson, you will find out that she's right wing, that she's linked to Pegida in, um, uh, in Germany, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I think, you know, you have to take all of these accusations with a pinch of salt as we're all pretty much getting painted into the same corners. Um, so she says here, make no mistake, it's not about your convenience and it's not about saving the planet. It will be a complete impoverishment and enslavement of all the people. If you want to listen to her complete or full digital age um, recording, it's at the Epoch Times. Again, the caveat e Epoch Times is uh, Falun Gong, which is a U.S. State Department religious movement that is being weaponized against China, very similar to the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. I just want to make that point clear that I don't endorse the, the Epoch Times particularly. But let's have a listen to what she says about 15 uh, minute cities. A green certificate, the COVID pass, that was a test balloon to get people to having to produce some kind of a QR code, you know, just getting people used to that. Now what they're slamming us with is these 15 minute cities. It, make no mistake, it's not about your convenience. It's not that they want you to be able to, you know, uh, have uh, all of these places that you need to get to very close. Um, and it's not about saving the planet either, by the way. The 15 minute cities, they will have to have those before they can lock you down. And that's what we're talking about here. So in Great Britain, some county already passed legislation. They will be able to impose a climate lockdown. That's the next step. That's what we're talking about. So in order to do that, they will have to have these 15 minute cities. Uh, the next step then, of course, will be um, you are only allowed to leave your immediate area for, let's say, two or three times a year. So, but there's other people that may have more money and they can, they can actually buy your uh, passings off of you. So guess what? The poor people will be left in these 15-minute neighborhoods while the 
ones that are better off um, get to go wherever they want to go. So this is what we're talking about, you know. Um, look at Saudi Arabia, for instance. They're pulling up Naum City. Um, they call it the line. So this is like a structure in the middle of the desert, 200 kilometers long, 200 meters wide, 500 meters high, and it will house up to nine million people. Oh, isn't that just brilliant? If I wanted to get total control of the people, that's exactly where and how I would house them. And then having them on a three, me uh, three meals a day prescription, well, guess what will happen if you do not do as you are told? They will probably cancel that. It's so easy. So that's what we're talking about. And uh, when you really take all of this together, there is no other way for me to, to actually say this. It will be a complete impoverishment and enslavement of all the people. And I'm stating it so clearly because that's what it seems like and that's what it looks like to me. Well, Vanessa, she's clearly a far-right conspiracy theorist, but uh, I want to. I want to. You're being facetious. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> to be clear. Uh, absolutely. Yes. Just to be clear. No, I want to just pick one thing that she said there, and that was this this notion that that uh, you know we'd only people will only be allowed to leave certain areas at certain certain number of times per year, and uh, uh, mm. and that therefore that penalizes the poor. Well, I just want to to say that although I haven't seen in the UK at least, I haven't seen that quite to that degree just yet. But if we look at Oxford, for example, and Oxford's proposals for this, when they set mm -hmm. up their, when, when they install their cameras for their uh, zones in, in Oxford, um, you will be allowed to travel through those zones a limited number of times per year. And if you want mm -hmm. to travel through those zones, through those cameras, more often than that, you've got to pay a fee, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. we're, al we're already, even at this embryonic stage, already seeing this type of thinking creeping into the, the the plans for this. So, you know, I have no doubt whatsoever that that, that video clip will be, uh, if it's picked up by mainstream press, will be described as right wing conspiracy. <laughs> but in fact, she's yeah. she's hitting the nail on the head, as you said. Yeah, and I do actually recommend that people watch her entire um, talk. It's it's well worth it. She's very on the mark on almost everything that she talks about. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Patrick, uh, let's leave uh, the program today with, uh, well, drag. A little bit of culture. I thought we'd have a little cultural segment at the end. Um, so I brought this one up from the Guardian Newspaper of the Year. They, that, yes. That's been on there for a few years. What year were they Newspaper of the Year? Or is it everywhere? Or do they give themselves that award? I don't know. Yeah, who knows? Who knows? Anyway, the Guardian, here they go. So this is an opinion, under opinion, drag. I love that. So this was from March. So drag shows bans are sweeping across the U.S. or a chilling attack on free speech. This is uh, Suzanne Postel. I think she was with the Penn Institute. Um, and so anyway, the, so that, that's the sort of conversation. There's a backlash against the right-wing outrage yes. of uh, drag shows for children, drag, drag queen story hour, etc. So there's been a big pushback. It's a big culture war issue. Ron DeSantis and various people are, you know, spearheading this effort, right? Right. So Hollywood is hitting back. Hollywood is hitting back. And here is one Hollywood A-list actor who's based... A-list? I'm not sure, but well, okay. Used to be an A-list, I guess. Yes. But um, now he does mobile phone uh, ads, ads yeah, for, for E. But anyway, here he is, and basically he's saying, we need to stop this hysteria. Drags, drag shows aren't that bad. They're not harmful. They're not bad for kids or anything like that. I don't think he specifically mentions kids, but I think that's what he's talking about. Yes. But uh, here he is. Let's roll this. Drag is an art, and drag is a right. Drag is a centuries-old art form of creativity, expression, and self-exploration. It's an opportunity to educate through entertainment, and it's not dangerous. At Six Degrees, we believe in amplifying the voices of those that are experiencing injustice. So join us in supporting the ACLU Drag Defense Fund by shopping our bonfire campaign. Right, so, so they're really all getting, so the ACLU's in there, Hollywood's in there, and they've got a Drag Defense Fund. <laughs> drag Defense Fund. So that's the latest degree of separation for uh, Kevin Bacon, total separation from uh, reality. reality, morality, and common sense. So. 
Congratulations. Another degree of separation for Kevin Bacon. Excellent. Okay. Well, look, we're, we're going to leave it there for today. Thank you very much to Vanessa, to Patrick, and thank you for, to Freddie Ponton for joining us today. Uh, we'll be back in a couple of minutes uh, for some extra. If you're a UK Cold member, we hope to see you there. Uh, otherwise, have a great weekend. We'll see you 1 p.m. as usual on Monday. Bye-bye.